Christians as citizens of heaven, um, while also not forsaking uh, justification by faith. Um, you know, if you if you go travel to another country and uh, as an American citizen, in many ways you're representing your country. Right? And as a citizen of heaven, um, Paul will talk about in Christ in Philippi. There's this dual reality going on. You're in Christ if you're a believer, but you're living in New Jersey. And there's a tension there in your life, the already and the not yet. And as a citizen of heaven, there is an obligation in light of your justification to live a life worthy of the calling that you receive. But that never should cause us to confuse how it is we became forgiven and justified before God. I think those are some of the ways. I'm sure there's plenty more. I just wanted to go back to the replacement theology. I just wanted to hear like more of a like how are they how would you defend against someone saying that no, that's replacement theology. Heaven of theology is just replacing the church with Israel. Right. How would I do that? <laughs> is it, well, well why is that not the case, I guess? Why is why is it why is heaven of theology not replacing the church with Israel? And Israel still stands as its own and well, I mean, this is a huge debate, right? Yeah, so, I mean, all Israel will be saved in Romans. What does that mean? Uh, it's been understood in three main ways, even in the Reformed tradition. Um, and um, so, so, you know, it's really, a, I think, a bigger question than I can answer right now okay. in terms of, I, I would want to understand what they mean by that. First of all, I would want to understand what do they mean by the church uh, replacing, because we would see the church as existing before Christ's coming. Right. And, uh, so we're really on two very different starting points. Israel was the visible people of God, not the invisible people of God. So if you think of a big circle, uh, visible Israel is the people of God, visibly the people of God, but not all of them were elect. I mean, you could think of, I can throw out some names, Jeroboam. Jeroboam was not a true believer. He was not walking in the faith of his father. David was. So you have a mixed people there, visibly, but the church was the invisible people of God at that time. Uh, those who were embracing the same faith that you and I do. But it was, and it was there, but it's more like a flower that hadn't blossomed yet. I think that's how Voss describes like the theology. Is, um, you know, it's not that we went from one thing and then did something else, plan B, or a, a separate plan. It's really the, the flowering of that. You know, the sun rises and the flower starts to open. And as you go from, you know, Abraham, he's seeing a nice flower, and Moses is seeing it open and bud a bit, but then by the time you get to the New Covenant, it's blossoming, and it's beautiful. And you see all the more. It was always there, but you understand it more fully, and you can appreciate it more fully. So to follow up with that, do you think, do you think the, do you think that the language of new, old is helpful or useful? It's biblical. <laughs> so, right. yeah. And it helps us keep the discontinuity in, in, in shape. We'll talk a little bit more about discontinuity at uh, Sunday School, Lord willing, so. Now. Yeah, you had mentioned this morning that, um, obviously, uh, when, that, when the, uh, God the Father separates the animals and mm -hmm. makes the covenant that uh, if there's a problem, God will die. And then you said, and then God died. Um, because you were talking about Christ. Right. So, you know, I'm thinking here and my head's kind of rattling and I'm thinking, um, okay, God the Father can die, God the Son can die, but that can be, of course, you can see it. And so uh, it, it was such, it was jarring and yet it was illuminating, but I'm not really clear about what it was. Well, is it clearly the Father, though, in <coughs> I say that again? Was it 15? Was it just the Father in view? Well, so no. the Trinitarian God. So I think that's the... I understand where you're coming from. It's a great question. And I think that, um, you know, historically... Well, first of all, we want to see this. Um, you know, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You would, I know you would agree with all this, but it just helps me to sort of sure. work through it. Um, so Jesus Christ is God. And natures do not do things. Persons, I mean, persons do. So Jesus Christ, the Son, as God, died. So that's why we can say that thou, my God, shouldst die for me. Um, so I think we have the triune God, the one God, right. in three persons, making this covenant with, um, with Abraham. And God the Son, as God, you know, he is fully God, died for that covenant. 
And so it's a, it's a testament, testamentary covenant for that reason, because um, he dies so that we receive the blessing. Um, but we already have the blessing, even without, well, not the ultimate blessing. I mean, that's why it got a little crazy, because... <laughs> Well, the, the promise of the blessing was bec um, was because of what he was going to accomplish. There was no historical contingency of whether or not Christ would come and die at this point. So Abraham has received the blessing beforehand in light of what Christ would do. We have received it afterhand in light of what Christ did. Right. Obviously. I guess the thing, it, it was to it was that statement that was that was the have sort of emphasized, in the Reformed tradition, have emphasized that continuity. And even appealed to passages like, do not take your Holy Spirit away from me, Psalm 51, as being evidence of an indwelling. But then they'll appeal to passages like, uh, for the discontinuity, passages like uh, John 7, I think it is, with a preposition in and uh, in and out, you know, with and in the differences, and seeing it as God's Spirit is sort of working around influencing people, but he's not within them. You know, you, you go to the temple, you become the temple. But I think in biblical theology and in systematics, in the Reformed tradition at least, there's been some cross-pollinization where people are starting to listen to each other's arguments and we're getting some pretty nuanced stuff. And, and so um, the difference really, um, what, what, what I think we have to affirm is, is that no one believed apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. No one produced good works apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, Paul's clear on this, it's the fruit of the Spirit. Right. Um, now, whether or not we want to sort of quibble over prepositions, I mean, that's up to you. Some people would say that the passages like with David having the spirit within him or the guys who built the tower not having the spirit within them, uh, they would say that that's just a special function of the Holy Spirit and not representative of an indwelling more corporately in the people of God. Um, that's fine, but I don't really, I don't, I'm not convinced 100% that David's just worried about his you know, his, his public role and his public office and kingship when he says, do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Um, but the big continuity difference is that when the Spirit comes at Pentecost, it's the Spirit of the risen Christ. So there's functional relationship there. And now it's the risen and exalted Christ who has sat down and he gives his Spirit. So while the Spirit was active in the Old Testament, he has acted more powerfully today because he's the Spirit of the risen Christ who has accomplished our salvation. And I think I, that's the biggest difference um, through our union with Christ. One of these things can also be that in the Old Testament, it wasn't so much like dwelling as much as it was uh, accompanying uh, the Spirit was with them. 
That, that's one of the positions I, I, I tried to lay out. Yeah, that's, that's one, one way people handle that, this prepositions and passage um, in John is, you know, he's with you, going to be in you. Um, and so that's one way. Uh, but it is still debated about whether or not there was some sort of indwelling, um, even in the Old Testament. Um, but I think we do, we really want to sort of hold firm to the Spirit produces faith, the Spirit produces fruit. But the Spirit in the New Testament coming is more powerful and more powerfully active in the people of God because it is the Spirit of the risen Christ. All right, we'll stop right there. Um, so I think most of the food stuff is ready. Um, Chris, can you duck back and see if there's anything we need to... Um, and so um, with that, I'm going to pray for our dinner, and then we can hop in line. Uh, he's here all night. <laughs> Hang out with Kyle. They're going to be having coffee, figuring out the Trinity. And uh, so feel free to jump in on that. So let me, let me pray for our dinner. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this food you've provided for us. You use it to nourish our bodies. Would you bless uh, our evening? Uh, would we honor you in our conversations? Would we encourage one another? Um, would your name be lifted up high? We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Pastor Chris. Just setting up the tables for the place to sit there.